With me today is a snooker correspondent from The Times, a regular Sky snooker commentator, and a man who talks stato everything he knows, Mr. Phil Yates. You're too kind, Steve. Pleasure, pleasure to come along here today. I've enjoyed your, your company over many uh, times talking about snooker. You're a wealth of information on the statistics of the game and also many stories about the players. But one thing that I've never been able to ask you, because I've never actually interviewed you, you've always been in the chair interviewing me straight after a match, okay? What am I like to be, to be uh, interviewing after a match when I've lost? You're in the top three, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> we either get something extraordinary or nothing at all. And of course, that makes a story in itself. If Steve Davis has lost a match, or Stephen Hendry, as he does nowadays in the old silent press conference, comes off and says nothing, that in a story in itself. We say, you know, Steve was unable to speak, he was so disappointed. And that conveys to our readers, or our listeners, whoever, you know, just how uh, devastated you were by that particular defeat. Recently, I, I lost a match that I, I felt I should have won, and, and we have about, I'm too, too sure people know actually how, much, how long we have before we go into the press room, which in a way is a bit like, it's a bit like going into the electric chair, especially if you've lost. If you've won, it's a marvellous place to walk into. You walk in, you'd be a head up high, and you walk in and you think, what a question, they're going to ask me about me, okay? But when you've lost, the last thing you want to talk about is, is what's happened and why you've failed. And you have approximately 10 minutes before you have to go in and face the audience. 20 minutes if the winner goes in first. So 20 minutes grace. You may just about be able to get your thoughts together to say something nice about your opponent if, um, if, you, if you can get you think of anything, I suppose. But what happens is you then walk in cold, really. Uh, you haven't probably said a word since you've lost, come off the table. And you start asking questions. There's an embarrassed silence, isn't there? We don't know what to say first, and of course, we try to be diplomatic, but ultimately we've got to ask the question, why did you lose? And of course, as you say, just coming after the, the actual match itself, it must be very difficult to take. I mean, I know when I was playing amateur snooker, a very humble level, if I lost an important match, I didn't speak for two days to my father and my mother, let alone to some complete strangers. So it must be quite difficult, that. And I feel, from, from my point of view, rather embarrassed, as you say, to ask the questions. But of course, it's our job, we have to. But then you have a time when you're sitting in the room waiting for the player to come in. So it must be quite funny, because you, from, from one, mo one moment you're, you're, you're there laughing and joking, taking the mickey, obviously, out of the player. You know, in what, one shape. As soon as he walks in the door, you've got to be serious. Yeah, that has happened on a number of occasions. Most of the time we're talking about, you know, the way the story is going to go, obviously. <laughs> we're thinking about, you know, past defeats, what it, the context of the match, where it all stacks up. But of course, when a player comes in, cathedral-like atmosphere, well, Steve... You must be really disappointed with that one. If I got a fiver for every time I'd said that, not Steve, of course, <laughs> anybody who plays on the circuit, I think I'd be quite wealthy. What, what's the worst you've seen anybody go into a press uh, room and uh, it, probably, it may well be me, I don't know. What's, what's, what's the worst situation you've seen? The Irish Open last year in Dublin, it was the worst venue ever. The press room was like the opposite of the TARDIS. It was smaller when you went in it than it actually looked. Right. Um, it was an awful arena. The tournament wasn't on this season, thankfully. Stephen Hendry had just lost to Tony Drago. Now, I saw the last couple of frames, and no one in history had a worse run than Stephen Hendry in those two frames. And it was, a, you know, just terrible circumstances for him. Plus, he was having a terrible run at the time as well. And he came into the press room, and uh, we asked him a number of questions. And the only response was, someone said, you must be very disappointed, Stephen. And he said, shrewd. And apart from that, it was deathly silence. You could, <coughs> you could cut the atmosphere with a knife, and... I just couldn't wait for that press conference to finish because it was obvious, no matter what you asked him, if you asked him what he'd had for breakfast that morning, he wasn't going to give us an answer. You're doing these interviews like 10 minutes after the, the players come off the table for, for deadlines, but there must be a part of you that would rather give the player a couple of hours. You probably get some better quotes in, in some ways, but you may not get some as honest a quote. Time constraints, yes, very much so. It isn't too bad in the afternoons, of course, if a player finishes a match at, say, 5 o'clock, we're in no real rush to speak to him. But of course at night, that's the problem with snooker in terms of uh, journalism, at night we're always battling against deadlines, so consequently we need those players to come into the press uh, area as quickly as possible. And that's why we don't get objective responses, because of course if a player's won as well, he's on a, a very high level. So he isn't going to maybe say the things he should say, just as if he's lost. You, you, you probably, as, as journalists, are a bit frustrated sometimes that not enough snooker 
uh, copy gets in the papers. Uh, we, we certainly are in the game because we feel it's a relevant uh, game for British sport. It's watched by millions of viewers, but in relation to, to some of the other sports, it gets very little. You know, the, how many words would you write on a, on a piece? Uh, Eternally frustrated. Now, I'm extremely lucky in this sense because I write for the Times. Now, without fear or favour, I can say this, they devote more space than any national newspaper in Britain and consequently in the world to snooker. So I'm in a very fortunate position. But having said that, generally across the board, snooker is treated very badly. When you consider the amount of viewing figures the game still gets in the big tournaments, I think people at home want to read it. That's the uh, thing that galls me most. And yet, it doesn't get the space it deserves. Um, I don't know why it is really. I think it must be some kind of cultural bias against the game. Because the television viewing figures, 10, 11 million for a final, still a, an exceptional final, such as yours against Ronnie O'Sullivan at the Masters uh, a few years ago, 4, 5 million for a run of the mill final. And yet you might see it a couple of paragraphs in, in some of the papers. It, it really is disgusting. And there's no logical reason for it. The only thing I can think about is actual politics back at the paper. I know that my paper um, realises the importance of snooker to its sports pages. And uh, once again, I'll say I'm very lucky. Daily Telegraph give it a good service as well. But you'd think the tabloids would go into the game more than they do. The only time they seem interested is if there's some kind of outrageous story, some kind of scandal. Yeah, there's plenty, uh, there's plenty in the feature pages. I mean, sometimes there's some very good features on the snooker players. Uh, and there's enough snooker players around of the, the new breed to write good feature, feature articles about. Um, so I don't think we're sort of particularly uh, badly served in that department. But um, some of the matches, I can understand if they finish late. But it's, it's, the, it's the matches where they would have enough time to get the copy, and I think I'm a bit aggrieved about. Yeah, the, the, one, the tournaments, I can never understand why there isn't a thing in the paper, are the ones overseas. China Open, China International, you know, Thailand Masters, that kind of thing. Because they aren't on television here, so people are hungry for information. If they put only ten paragraphs, maybe, which isn't a big piece, if they put that kind of piece in the paper every day, I'm sure the circulation of those papers would gradually increase. Obviously, we're talking about a very small number of people who are that keen on snooker. But it certainly wouldn't lose. I remember you recounted me a, a story um, when Darren Morgan played Dave Harold in the final of the Thailand Open, and there's a seven hour, uh, Thailand seven hours in front. A, a marvellous situation uh, arose there when you had all the time in the world for Darren Morgan to say whatever he wanted, but of course he lost in that final, didn't he? And I think, uh, what did Darren, well, Darren came in the door after... Well, he was rather uncomplimentary about his opponent, saying, you know, you shouldn't really have lost to him and all this. But that's the way Darren is, and that's one of the reasons I like Darren, and I wish more players were like him, because he does say those outrageous things. He doesn't sit on the fence. There are no platitudes with Darren. It's uh, black or white. If he's won, he's over the moon. If he's lost, you know, <laughs> it feels like kicking the dog, and probably does. Um, but he says what he thinks, and I like that about him. And, uh, and he, was supposed to, he was supposed to beat Dave Harold, wasn't he, in the final? Everybody thought he was going to beat Dave Harold. That's right, yeah. Well, he played Dave Harold in the final. Harold beat him by nine frames to three. And, of course, this was Darren's big chance, certainly in his own mind, to win a world ranking event. Harold had a 1-3-7 break. He won one frame after needing a snook on the pink. You know, it was good stuff. And, of course, Dave Harold at the time was a 500-to-1 outsider to win that tournament. And the great story was that his brother, I think, had, had a £10 bet on him back home to, to win the event. So his brother wins five grand. And poor old Darren's left there picking up the pieces. Darren's walked in the press room and he's gone, uh, how on earth I lost to him, I'll never know, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, all the press lads have gone, Darren, we haven't got a rush for the copy. You know, do you want another ten minutes yeah, before you, right, yeah. before you, know, you can say something nice about it? <laughs> yeah, well, he couldn't wait to get it off his chest. I think what Darren was hoping, actually, was that the press conference would continue until we went on the plane, which was twelve hours later. <laughs> and I think it would have continued had we not uh, put a stop to it and got on with the stories. Uh, are you, you're a decent snooker. What's your highest break at snooker? Well, I made a 106. That was my highest in a match. Uh, I've made plenty of them in practice, but... Uh, you know, never good enough to be a professional. So I you mean, must have played to a, a fair old standard then, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, I, I captured the town, uh, town team, captured the local league team in interleague competition. Um, I could have turned professional, you know, when the game went out and paid my 500 quid. And maybe I'd have won the odd match at Blackpool, maybe two or three, you know, in, in a particular tournament. But I was never under any illusions, not like a lot of them. I knew I would never have any chance whatsoever of winning any money at the game. So I decided to, uh, to try and uh, get into the game in another way. You, you already were involved in, uh, in journalism before you started to play snooker. Well, how did, how, what was your, what's well, your history? We, we know you as a commentator. Yes. We turn up and you write stories about us, uh, and they're complimentary. And we, we know that there's a great trust between the snooker players and the snooker journalists. We know that we're going to get a fair, fair deal out of you. But we don't necessarily know so much about your past and, and how you got into the, the situation. Well, 37. Went to my first major snooker event in 1972 at Sully Park, British Legion. 
went with my father to see Alex Higgins play John Spencer in the world final there. What an atmosphere, that was beer crates. You could cut the atmosphere with a knife, literally, because it was so smoky. <laughs> um, Alex, of course, won the match. Then we went to the World Championship and the Benson Edges Masters for a number of years afterwards. I a big snooker fan, your father as well? Oh, very much so, yeah, very much so, yes. Uh, we went down to London, we went all over the place. Exhibitions as well, we were big Higgins fans at the time. Right. Um, then I started playing snooker seriously when I was at university. Um, I've actually played a 24-hour snooker marathon once, which was uh, quite a, an entertaining thing, against a very bad player. He actually won the first frame and never won another one all day. <laughs> 23 and a half hours without winning a frame, that's going to be a record. That's cruel. Yeah. Um, then I got back from university in 1983, graduated in economics and politics, the, the latter of which has been very useful in snooker over the years. Right. Um, uh, started to play uh, with a very good team. I was very lucky to be, uh, to be picked for them. Um, and it sort of, sort of grew from there. But the Birmingham area was quite a hotbed of snooker, wasn't it? At one very stage. much so, very much so. And a, a lot of really good amateurs. It's just a pity that although we've got quantity of good players, we've never really had real, real quality since the days of Steve James and Martin Clark. Uh, they're going down the rankings now. Before that, Graham Miles, of course. That's right, yeah, 1974, uh, runner-up in the World Championship. He was, he was a great player, great touch around the black. Um, so, as I say, basically, um, I, I became more and more interested in snooker. And then I started doing some caddying on the golf circuit as well, and it made me realise how much I wanted to be involved in sport. I just love the camaraderie. Um, I remember I caddied in the 1988 Open for a friend of mine, and he played a practice round with Gary Player, Bernhard Langer and Mike McNulty. Now, I was in seventh heaven. I still would be, actually. <laughs> but, um, it made me realise I wanted to be involved in sport. I actually, at the time, since leaving university for five years, I was manager of a betting office, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is a bit of a, a change from doing what I'm doing now. And uh, so in 1988, through a mutual friend, I approached Clive Everton, the BBC commentator, and uh, he took me on on a trial basis, began by writing local columns in the newspapers. And then he just mushroomed from there, basically. Did my first commentary in the early 90s and began working for Sky in April 1993 at the International Open. So along the way, you've, you've not only been um, watching the players um, performing when you've been commentating, but you, you also write about them. But uh, uh, perhaps all the journalists, and not being nasty to, to a lot of them, you actually, in my eyes, take the job to another level because you actually watch what you're writing about. Oh, very much so. I mean, yes. uh, we're not we're not naming names. It's not. I mean, journalism, in, in one respect, is you you actually have, uh, have only got a certain amount of uh, in column inches to write, and you're not necessarily needed to watch all of the snooker. Mm. But you actually do because you're a snooker fan. Yeah, I think you've got to. I really do. Um, I always find that I write a better piece, a more informed piece, when I've done a commentary on that particular match. Now, I might not have as much time to write it because I'm dashing from the commentary box to the press room and then back again. But I find that I do because I've watched every single ball. Even for me in the press room, there are distractions, you know, you're answering the phone, maybe doing a radio piece, and you don't get every single nuance. You don't see the turning point, the shot that might have changed it. You don't see the changing uh, body language of the players as you would if you're in that box and, uh, and observing them with great scrutiny. What do you prefer most, the, 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 the correspondence or the, uh, the, the commentating? The commentating is much easier. It's spontaneous. Um, TV works better paid than newspaper work as well, so in that respect it's good. But I enjoy the commentary box. It's, it's fantastic, you know, to be in that privileged position. I remember a few years ago, um, I got rather blasé, and I was working to the Crucible one morning. 17 days. Bear in mind, I don't just do commentary. Not at the Crucible, I don't do any commentary. I have radio work and newspapers, and it really is a tough 17 days. And it was about day seven, and I hadn't had enough sleep, you know, the fire alarm had gone off in the hotel. And I was walking down to the Crucible, feeling very grouchy. And there was this young lad and his father walking towards the, the theatre, and the kid was so overwhelmed with what he was going to see. And it took me back to the days when I used to go to Manchester, to Deansgate, the city exhibition halls, to see the World Championship with my father. And it really was a wake-up call. I thought, cool, you know, how ungrateful have I been over the last couple of months, basically. It had been building up. And since then, I've been like a, <laughs> like a kid with a new toy again. The, 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 the world of uh, the press room, which is its own little world, in a way, a, a snooker venue, is a place, that we, we have a players' room, um, where the players are supposed to sit when they're not playing their matches. And there's a press room. And it's a very, it's a very good atmosphere. Players are allowed to come in the press room and sit in the press room if they like. Yeah. I always choose to sit in the press room. The characters in the press room and some of the comments and the banter is just phenomenal, isn't it? Oh, it really is superb. It, it's fantastic. The way I look at it, it's like um, being in a sixth form common room when you're in your 40s or your 30s. It's the, it's the only atmosphere I've ever known where grown men act like schoolboys all day and get paid for it. 
but you have some marvellous characters who, who I mean, who in, a, in a way are creating their own little art, art form worlds by writing pieces. Sometimes even allowed to make up their own headlines or decide what, what they're going to write, you know, what the headline's going to sound like. But well, that's an interesting point, actually, because one thing the journalists don't do is actually write the headlines, and they're the things that get us into most trouble. Oh, really? There's a classic example at the Nation's Cup a couple of months ago, where Darren Morgan, <laughs> again Darren Morgan, had said he would rather be playing, or, or what would rather be at the tournament for Wales as the non-playing captain. He got no confidence in his game, and he thought he was a handicap to the team. And what he said was, I want to be here, but I don't want to be here in a playing capacity. So, of course, this went on to the Press Association, which is the agency that sends reports all around the country. And it, it appeared on teletext, as we've written it, basically, but the headline was, Morgan, go on, I don't want to be here. Now, for someone as patriotic as Darren, that was a total nightmare. And, of course, he's running around the hotel, having seen this on his TV in the room, <laughs> saying, who's responsible for this? Was it you? Was it you? And none of us, of course, were. So, in the end, we had to ring teletext and get them to uh, amend the headline slightly. And that happens all the time. So how do, you, how do you deal with that then? I mean, the players come in and they're sort of screaming and shouting at you for, for things that have been written. Very much so, yeah. I remember another one when Martin Clark was beaten by Danny Fowler in the World Championship qualifiers a few years ago. And Martin Clark was a teammate of the Express and Star snooker correspondent John D for years, so they're very good friends. So Martin knew he wasn't responsible for this. The headline was, Dustbin Danny, because Danny Fowler was a dustbin man, Dustbin Danny dumped Dismal Clark, <laughs> <laughs> which wasn't exactly complimentary. So, uh, yeah, it is sometimes difficult, but I think they understand now the workings of the press. I know you s certainly do, and uh, uh, Ronnie O'Sullivan's also very interested in the, in the press room. He comes in and messes about on our laptops and asks us how things work, and I think a lot of players in that respect are, are like that. I think the relationship between the players in snooker and the press is probably the best in snooker. It's a little bit, a little bit incestuous, in fact, because although we're writing about you and we're trying to be objective, I mean, I like to think that I'm, I'm friends with you, and I like to think I'm friends with Stephen Hendry and most of the top players. And sometimes you've got to say, hold on a minute, you know, I've got to be critical here, and you really have got to watch whether you go over the line of journalistic sort of acquaintance or friendship. What, what do you think now snooker needs to do in relation to the press to help relationships uh, develop. What do we need to do? What do, you, what do we need to uh, uh, garner interest in the, in the newspapers? I think the most important thing snooker can do is very, very simple. And I don't know whether it can reconcile the needs of the press with the needs of television. Snooker is a nocturnal game. It's played at night predominantly, certainly the big matches, but I think we play too late at night. Uh, a classic example was the recent Benson Hedges Masters final which finished at midnight. Now, Ken Doherty missed the black off the spot for a 147. A young lad, Matthew Stevens, won the title, £165,000. And yet it finished just before midnight. Now, that meant, apart from the readers in London who were going the final editions, no one in the country would be able to pick up the Times, the Telegraph, or whatever, the following day, and find out who won the match. So I think we really need, whenever possible, to have earlier start times. What about CFAX? What about um, the teletext? Tremendous. I you mean, think it's great? You're, as a statistician, you think it's great? I personally think it's, it's ruined a lot of sports, uh, the interest in a lot of sports, because obviously snooker, you never know when the game's going to finish. So you've got to show highlights, but yes. everybody goes to teletext. But that isn't a problem on Sky Sports, you see, because we're committed to live snooker. So consequently, <laughs> you're watching it as it happens. Um, I think text is, is a, a, a very good idea, but of course the other thing now, of course, is the internet. Uh, and the internet's going to be very big in snooker. Um, oh, you wouldn't know about that, Phil, because, I mean, I in the press room, you go around, you go around the, <laughs> you go around the press room, okay, so everybody's got the latest laptops, okay, and then we come to Phil Yates, and up until recently, anyway, I think you still had a typewriter, did you not? Well, yeah, I had a typewriter until about 1993. Oh, I said, my memory, so I thought it was last year you got rid of your typewriter. <laughs> yeah, 1993, 1994, and I remember I was... <laughs> you know the year. <laughs> I, I Statistician would always know the year he got rid of his typewriter. I remember I was at a tournament in Belgium, and, and we were in a tent outside the press room. It was a tent, and it was freezing cold. It really was awful. But your ribbon jam. And John D, who was a great mate of mine, who was the... Um, Snooker correspondent of the Daily Telegraph isn't the most even-tempered of men, let's put it that way. We call him Mr. Grumpy on the circuit. He's a great guy, but he's a grumpy son. Anyway, <laughs> um, he said, if you don't get rid of that typewriter, it's going out the window. And so I said to him, well, there isn't a window, John, it's a tent. And he said, well, you know what I mean. And I thought after that, I thought, well, listen, I, you know, I better sort of get, you know, get a, a quieter implement. So I actually bought a very old uh, PC of John Street, the referee. 
And now I've got a Toshiba, it's fine, absolutely fine, no problem at all. I'm e even emailing in Oh, you're, so you're up to speed now? I'm up to speed oh, now, it's yeah. frightening. Yeah. The first time I looked over your shoulder, and you, in, you were a new press boy in the room, because I've been around longer than you in the snooker world. I mean, it feels like you've been around for a year, you're a, <laughs> an old mark. But the first time I looked over your shoulder, I spotted a spelling mistake, excuse me. <laughs> I spotted a spelling mistake. I forget what the words were now. It was, I described somebody as a slow coach, and, I, and, and on, on my piece of paper, I said he was a slow couch. Oh, that's right, I ripped you to shreds. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. And of course, at the time, you must realise this, when I came into the game, um, you were right at the top of, of the sport, and I mean, from, from, a, from my sort of humble level, I looked up to you so greatly that you, there were about four or five people in snooker, and I, 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 I felt very disinclined to call you by your Christian name. <laughs> I mean, I always call Fred Davis Mr. Davis, and I remember I called you Mr. Davis for the first three times, and then you went, listen, it's Steve, okay. So I thought, well, do I call him by his first name or what? I mean, it was that kind of situation. And then you come into the press room and notice this spelling mistake. I was mortified. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think straight for three days. I felt sorry for you a little bit, because uh, you, in a way, it's, it's unfair. I sort of, perhaps... I've grown up a bit now, I don't know, I think probably would have bullied you a bit. You know, anybody knew in, you bullied, in, into a clicky area. Did you feel like you, you were an outsider until you were accepted? Uh, yes, but people are very, very friendly towards me, I, I suppose. You know, I'm pretty easy going and, and I like a laugh, so consequently I, I sort of blended in. The only person that really did intimidate me, and he still does, is uh, Alex Higgins. I have to say this, he was really good to me. He never, never a crossword. We, we got on fine. And I've written some very, very critical pieces about Alex against his behaviour, but, cool, he intimidated me. When he walked into a press room, it was awful. Mind you, I mean, he must have had... I mean, Alex is, is a, an amazing character. He, he's certainly by no means uh, unintelligent, as we know. He's, he's probably well, more well-read than most of the snooker players. But he's, he's, he's such a changeable character. Um, so you've probably seen his best and worst interviews. Oh, very much so. I mean, his worst one, undoubtedly, was um, the World Championship in 1990. In the March, just to put it into context, this was when he allegedly threatened to have, he said, I'm going to have you shot to Dennis Taylor at the World Team Cup. Well, it was, it was, it was a snooker-related thing. It was to do with captaincy of the team, wasn't that's it? That's right, yeah, that's right. Which is all fair, fair in another one. <laughs> plus, another, plus another number of, of insults, apparently. So <laughs> he was sort of boiling up to, to sort of this, this state of, of terrible anger. And he played in the World Championship and lost in the first round to Steve Davis. Steve Davis. <laughs> <laughs> Freudian slip. Steve James. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, and he stayed in the arena. He stayed in his chair. Didn't get up. The referee and, and, and his opponent left. And he just stayed in his chair in the crucible. It was eerie for about 25 minutes. And we're all thinking, cool, what's he going to say now? You know, what's he going to say? So we piled into the interview room at the crucible, which, as you know, is just to the side of the press room. And still, no sign of him. Now, I'm getting a little bit twitchy here because I'm close to deadline, that word again. So I happened to just look around like this over my shoulder to see where he was. And just as I did that, the press officer at the time, a guy called Colin Randall, who was a smashing lad, said, Alex, please, into the press room. And just as he did that, he whacked Colin in the stomach. So I've turned Well, oh, Colin had some stomach as well, didn't he? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether, you know, Alex hurt his uh, shoulder because of the recoil, but... Um, <laughs> anyway, I turned around to Steve Atchison, who was sitting to my left-hand side. Steve was now with the Daily Star. Actually, then, I think he might have been with the Times. I said, he's just hit Colin, he's just hit Colin. But by this time, of course, Alex is now on the stage. Colin's <laughs> doubled up on the floor. Yeah, so by this time, Alex is on the stage. And Steve's gone, oh, stop, stop playing about it. He thought I was winding up, because, of course, we wind everybody up all the time in the pressure. So then this interview went on, this rambling soliloquy about how he was going to take the game to the European Court of Human Rights and... You know, I'm retiring from all this. I mean, it was just impossible to take down. And then he came off. I went back into the, into the press room, went on the phone. Alex Higgins was last night involved in a physical attack on a, an official at the Embassy World Championship. And Steve stopped me on the He said, why didn't you tell me? I said, I did tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but he just, couldn't be, he just couldn't believe it. Oh, it was terrible. It really was. And, and, and of course, you know, then it all cracked off. And that's why, um, along with the Dennis Taylor incident at the, the World Team Cup, that's why uh, Alex Higgins was banned uh, for a full season, the following season. Uh, he dropped from 14th to 120th in the world rankings. He was stripped of all these world ranking points. And he never really recovered from that because it was impossible then for him to rise back up the ladder. I think with Higgins, you know, it was a great shame what happened because from a purely commercial point of view, he was manna from heaven for snooker. Uh, I mean, we used to get great ratings when he played and he was an hypnotic personality. I remember seeing him in that 72 world final, the 82 world final, I watched in the attic of a room in Bradford where I was at university. And when he 
potted the final ball to beat Reardon to become champion again. I jumped up in the air in excitement and hit my head off the beam of the, <laughs> of the bedroom. And I was in great pain. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. But no, I, th I think Higgins was fantastic for the game. I think where the snook went wrong was that they didn't impose a hefty enough punishment on him when he headbutted Paul Hatherall <laughs> at the UK sorry. Championship all those years I'm sorry, before. I don't <laughs> <laughs> These are all surreal things, but of course they happen, you know. Well, um, well Alex is, a, is an absolute character. I mean, we know that. I mean, uh, uh, and, but apart from it, but he's also a 100% trier. Yes. Yeah, I mean, because he, he fell out the second floor of his girlfriend's flat, apparently, broke his leg. Yes. Okay? So most people would just take the time off. But he needed the points, he wanted to get back on the circuit, so what did he do? He's hopping around the table, with, still with a pot on, with the car still on. That tournament you're talking about, the European Open in Deauville, was the most incredible tournament I've ever been to. It was my first, actually, that I've been to from start to finish. The BBC signed a new deal for snooker uh, for, the, for the following five years. Uh, that was one story. And there were a load of little cameos. Kirk Stevens turned up on the back of a lorry, he, he thumbed his way over there, and Eugene Hughes came off at an interval once. Bear in mind, wearing a tuxedo and a bow tie, we're in northern France in a casino. So one of the punters assumed he was a waiter, and, asked, and she asked him for a drink. <laughs> I mean, it was one thing after another there. And then, of course, Higgins turns up, and he was hopping around the table, literally hopping, hop along Higgins, of course, as the headline said. And uh, he actually beat Les Dodd in the first round. It was the most remarkable achievement. He was bathed <laughs> in sweat at the end. I mean, what poor old Les Dodd must have thought of it. And then he eventually lost to, to Willie Thorne in the last 32. It's a great story. On the way back home, Trevor Baxter, who's probably my best mate in the circuit, who's a freelance, um, he was, uh, he was on, the, on, the, on the ferry on the way back, and Higgins was on the same ferry. And uh, they were downstairs with all the cars, and Higgins got lost, and he said, there he was, hopping around in a rather bad temper, trying to find his way up onto the galley so he could go and have something to drink or eat. <laughs> you just imagine all these fumes and all these cars, and there's Higgins hopping around. Towards the end of, the, of the, his recovery from a broken leg, when he was still in obviously a lot of pain, he probably did one of the most remarkable things that, that he ever achieved was beating an inform Stephen Hendry in the Benson Hedges Irish Masters. That's right, yes, 9 8. That was his actually his last major title, yeah. What an achievement that was. And of course, the level of expectation at Goffs is, is unbelievable for an Irish player and for indeed for any player they take to the hearts. Um, and and uh, Henry then, of course, was not too far away from his absolute peak. He was still on the upward curve, but it really was an incredible performance. Mind you, so many of them were. I mean, 1983 UK Championship final when he came back from 7-0 down to beat you. Thanks, Phil. Okay, I, I mean, <laughs> I thought I would remind you. But um, to beat someone who was playing so well from so well behind... You're, you're, but, but you're not wrong to, to quote Alex Higgins as, as your favourite player. I think there are so many people out there who would love to still see him around on the circuit. We're entertained not just by all the antics off the table, because that does attract some people to watch that wouldn't watch other players. They're not going to watch me if I just keep still in my chair. Yes. Other people are more fascinating to watch. Alex Higgins was more fascinating to watch in his chair than I was when I was playing. Well, he bought, he bought another element to it because of his, of his unpredictability. I think that's one of the reasons why people aren't watching Ronnie O'Sullivan play now. Nobody really knows what he's going to do next, whether he's going to be abject or brilliant. I mean, most of the time, he's, he's brilliant. Um, Higgins was my favourite player. Um, now, of course, I'm in journalism. I'm not, I'm not supposed to have favourites, but I'll say quite openly, I do. Not, I don't ever show my favouritism, hopefully, on commentary or in, my, uh, or in my stories. But, you know, there are certain people I love watching because, A, they've got such a wealth... A, a, a sort of background to them, uh, and there's so much to say about them, and others because they get, they've got an aura, uh, they've got an aura about them, an aura of, of importance. Yourself, obviously, and I'm not just saying that because you're here. Stephen Hendry, who I think has done remarkably. Um, there's a school of thought as to who is the, the greatest player in the history of the game. Now you say I know a lot about stats. Well, that's for you to say. But if you're going to go on statistics, and you're going to go on pure achievement. You cannot possibly have any debate. No. He's the greatest player in the game. He pushed the barriers back, I think, further than any player has. Uh, uh, Standard-wise, I don't think anybody's ever seen uh, the, 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 the relentless style of play. I mean, they I, I, I played some fairly relentless stuff in, in the pub, three centuries on the trot, I think, at one time, mm. um, but not in the same um, uh, quantity. Only occasionally, I would say. Well, you've had 270 centuries in professional competition, which is by far and away the second best. And he's fast approaching 500. I mean, it really is an incredible start, that. And I think he's made seven 147 maximum breaks, six of which have been on television. Um, 
I think the other thing to, to bear in mind as well, and I can say this because although I wasn't working at these tournaments, I was actually there, the pockets these days are much less forgiving than they were in the 80s, aren't they? Well, I, I think so, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think they are a lot tighter. And I think we, the, the new players, in a way, have a slight advantage. Is that that's what they're used to. Some of the older players who... who it, some, something that's asked of me a lot, they say, you know, you know what, why aren't you back to your old form? Questions say that all the time. Why can't you get back to your old form? Uh, and so I say, well, it's not as easy as that to judge. A, the players are generally better, so you're not getting people falling over against you. You're not playing somebody who's sort of, you know, got cataracts in the first round or something. So there's that part. You don't get the breathing space anymore. But also, I do remember, and it's very easy to say, oh, yeah, you remember them because you were getting the balls in the pockets. I remember the pockets been a lot easier, and on some footage I've seen, you can actually see they were bigger. I think the middles particularly, yeah. I mean, and that's of course where Stephen Hendry really does gain because if he runs out of position, he knocks one of those incredible balls into the middle pocket and off he goes. When I first came into the circuit, I was very fortunate actually, that tournament at Deauville again in 1989, the European Open. Every evening after the, uh, the work was done, as it were, in the press room, myself and John Parrott used to go off and practice. Now, this was a real eye-opener for me. I'm thinking, I'm a great player, you know, I'll show him how to play. One, three, five in practice you've made up. Well, well, that's right, yeah, yeah. but I'm, I'm thinking, I'll show him how to play. And at that time, of course, I was playing a lot. And I think I won one frame all week, if that, you know, <laughs> it was a real hiding. But the one thing I really learned, apart from watching him play close quarters, and he went on to win that tournament, was just how tight the pockets were. And I kept thinking to myself, well, hold on a minute, you know, they're making these breaks on pockets that are so much more tight than, than club tables. I think one of the problems with TV is that maybe optically they make, the, they make the pockets look bigger than they are and people say, oh, you know, they're playing in buckets in these tournaments. But that isn't the case at all. I can stand, stand here hand on heart and say that is not the case at all. They are really are tight. And the, you, you guys never fail to amaze me. The other thing you never fail to amaze me about is how you cope with pressure. I, mean, I remember when I used to play, bear in mind we were talking about one man and a dog stuff here. You know, <laughs> league matches. There was so. nobody watching them. That's right. Well, if you got one man and a dog, it was a full house, you know. And I used to get so nervous. It used to mean so much to me. And I can remember getting over shots in these most insignificant of things. And I feel like I was going to be sick, you know, because I was so nervous. Yeah, join and the you, club. You, Just join the club. Yeah, yeah but you... Yeah, but you <laughs> well, got, no, it's the same. Yeah, I, I know it's the same. But the thing was, I, I usually did miss, you know, whereas... Um, whereas you guys don't, I remember once I, I made a century break at the club, queuing great, I couldn't miss, and I went to play in a league match, and I played a 78 year old guy, Horace his name was, and he couldn't even get down over the queue, he's got something on his back and he was like this, and I was so nervous, I couldn't play, now, you're playing in the final frame, or close to the final frame of a major tournament, a world ranking event or whatever, and you can produce the goods, make a century break, make an 80 break or whatever, I mean you've done it countless times Steve, so don't, you know, don't, be, don't be modest here. And I, I just, that's the one thing I can't get my head around. I can't get my head around how you can do so well, feeling the way you must feel. I mean, Terry Griffiths says to me as well, you know, how nervous he used to become. And yet this is the guy who won the Masters with a 1-3-5 break in the final frame. So, you know, you might have been nervous, but you channeled it in a different way. Well, I think, I think some people are able to sort of yeah, dissipate it somehow. Uh, or to, once it starts, to forget that part of it. And I think what you do is, that when you're playing your best, in a way you're not thinking about anything. There's no real thoughts going through your mind. It's best not to be a technically minded player if you can get away with it. That's why I think players like Mark Williams, uh, to, to pick the player of today, is so dangerous. Because yeah. I'm sure he doesn't think about that at all. He just gets on and plays. I've always, all my career, I've been in a similar sta uh, situation to say somebody like Nick Faldo. Be wo not worried about my technique, but always been aware of it. So, say I was concentrating on changing something, I'd be thinking, part of my brain would be thinking about that as well. Now that's difficult to do, but when you're playing your best, you have no technical problems. What you do, from, a be from the best point of view, you're, you're actually just thinking about absolutely nothing, except for competing and enjoying competing. But getting into that f phase is so hard sometimes. So I think that's why players are in and out of form. Sometimes they can get themselves, as they say, in the zone. And other times, they just don't really get there. And, and I think it's been quoted, if you can play um, when it means everything, like it means nothing, mm. then you're in the perfect frame of mind. Well, Barry Hearn once said there's no interim state between complacency and panic. I mean, that's a good quote. I don't know whether it was an original one, but it's a good one. <laughs> well, I always wondered, what's the best quotes? What's the best quotes that people have come out with? There's World of Snooker. Well, I mean, I'm we, we may not be the, the brightest bunch in the world, but we're certainly not the least intelligent. We've got a streetwise uh, credibility, haven't we? So what have we come out with? 
the, the three best players for quotes, Ronnie O'Sullivan, because he just basically speaks his mind. There's no bull with Ronnie. There is no bull with Ronnie. He'll come into that press conference. He's field. retired a few times, hasn't he? That's right, yeah. But he genuinely thinks that at the time, of course, you see. A lot of people are thinking that, oh, I'm going to pack it in, you know. But he'll actually say it. And that's one thing I really like about him. He'll actually talk to you in the press conference like he talks to you afterwards, which I've got great admiration for. So he's brilliant for quotes because he's always got something going on, some great story. And then for actual eloquence, as it were, for words, yourself and John Parrott, head and shoulders above the rest. Stephen Hendry's pretty good, actually, as well, and he's getting, he's getting better. The best quote everyone remembers, just after you lost to Dennis on the black in 1985, which I'm sure is a match you've been reminded of on a number of occasions <laughs> since then. I think the last count, statistically-wise, was 1,076,000. Um, when you, you'd actually lost and David Vine interviewed, interviewed you at the table, you said, well, David, it was all there in black and white. I mean, that was a pretty good quote. I'm not too sure I thought it, was, it, it just came out like that, <laughs> yeah. but sometimes the best things do come out by accident. You actually confided to me once and said that on a number of occasions you've been playing, say you've been playing a lower-ranked player and you're 4-1 up, uh, and you're in the balls maybe to win, or sitting in your chair, you know, with the other guy needing a snooker. And rather than thinking about the match, you've let your mind wonder as to what you're going to say in the press conference. Now, that really is ultimate professionalism. Well, I don't think it's the, I'm not too sure if it's that. I think it's a, it's a bit of a distraction that I'd, I'd rather not have. But unfortunately, one thing you do know is you, you, you know the ropes. You know what happens. If it's your first season as a professional, you, you don't know what to expect. After a while, if you've been in the game a long time, then you know, once you've played your match, you do your press conference. Yes. And it can't help but cross your mind. It flashes. Oh, well, I'll, I could say that. And, and it's bad. And I hate, I hate it. I hate anything breaking my concentration. But you can't help have flashbacks. Yes. But I remember when I was playing Alex Higgins in my first ever tournament, um, back at, uh, what won the UK Championships, Coral UK Championships in 1980. I was... Um, 15-6 up, I think, against Alex Higgins. There was never a question that even if I put myself off for a few frames, I wasn't going to fall over the line. I, I, went, I won the 15th frame to go 15-6 up. I went outside to the toilet, and my manager met me, Barry Hearn, met me, uh, and, and we talked through what I was going to say in the speech. <laughs> I mean, what, a, what a thing to do. Yeah. But it wasn't professional. I think it's just you worry if you're going to say the wrong things, and that comes into it. In the, in the press room, I mean, we were talking about quotes. Um, well, there's a guy in there who we love to death, who's a, a guy called Tony Stenson, uh, uh, who, um, who actually, I know, we know so well, and I know him so well, that I actually trust him to make up quotes. <laughs> because you know full well that he's going to make them up anyway. It's not making them up. How would you explain the situation? Yeah. Well, I think if you're working for a tabloid, you know, quotes are everything, really. And I mean, Tony's a very skilled uh, operator. He really is. Um, he not just doesn't do just golf. He does football. Uh, he does uh, golf. As, uh, he does golf. He does loads of different sports. And uh, when Tony comes to snooker, obviously it's just the big events. And I think he just you know adds a bit of topspin. You know, he'd be the first to, to, to admit that. But he never he never uh, harms anybody. Not at all. It. No. All he does is enhance the game he's been reporting on. You know, in a tabloid style. So it's very different from the way I write, obviously. But I mean that's because I've got to write in a particular style for my paper. Oh yeah, he's a skilled practitioner, Tony. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if somebody's coming out with boring copy, he just he'll just make it sound exciting. The one great problem is, this is one of the reasons why I like Sky tournaments because. We've got the outside tables, and there's always something going on. If you've got a one-table situation with two opponents who don't particularly produce anything on the table, and then they come off and they don't say anything, that is the ultimate nightmare. That really is. Now, being a good player doesn't mean to say you're going to be good in press conferences. As you say, the first season, you know, you're sort of finding your feet, as it were, talking to the media. You don't know what's quite sort of appropriate to say, what isn't. Classic example nowadays, Matthew Stevens and Stephen Lee, they're really nice lads, great, and I, you know, I wish them every success, because I mean, they hit the ball so well, don't they, they, they deliver the cue beautifully. God, I wish I could uh, do that. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but they don't conduct themselves in press conferences as colourfully as the older players, so it's a little bit difficult sometimes to, to, to convey... Um, what, what they're thinking, what they, what they feel, because they, they just say, you know, these things like, I'm playing well, queuing well, and, you know, they don't expand, as it were, like the, like the old pros like yourself and John Parrott and people like that. So that is a difficulty, and I think that's one of the reasons why um, so many times, particularly when we're talking about previews for tournaments, uh, guys like ourselves fall back on the old favourites. The week before the Crucible can guarantee 
that we'll put in the paper people like Parrot, we'll put in the paper people like yourself, people like Jimmy, more so than the guys who maybe have got a more reason to be in the paper for what they've done on the table that year, purely and simply because you guys are more colourful. Now, 10, 15 years down the line, the Stephen Lees and the Matthew Stevenses will have acquired the media skills to be able to cope with it all, and they'll be in your position, and there'll be another batch coming through. Well, I, I agree with you, and I, th I think the, the characters in the game are every bit as strong as they ever, ever were, mm. uh, and more of them as well. It's just sometimes you don't get the breathing space. But you do get the breathing space to uh, show wonderful coverage on Sky TV. I personally, even though some of the bigger tournaments, um, uh, the World Championship and perhaps the Benson Hedges and Masters, are on BBC, the most entertaining tournaments for me are the live tournaments that are shown on Sky. Yes. You can sit there all day long. If you're a snooker fan, you get, what, eight, nine hours coverage a day? That's right, yeah. And, it's, and it's live. You can't turn over to, to text and find out uh, the result, which is, to, to me, the, 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 uh, that ruins uh, sport in general. You have to sit there and watch it, and you get the chance to watch live snooker as it happens, with all the, the, the foibles that go along. And also, so, as you go in the commentating box, now, um, live commentary as well, so to speak. And what I love about it, you know, I've got a monitor in there which gives me the scores of all the other tables. So I can see six going on this monitor, then 13. So I now know somebody's pot pink and black to win a particular frame. I can't wait until them back home. You know, I'm onto the lazy, onto the right. Can I just give them that score, you know, just to, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, fine, you know. I can't wait to tell people back home what's happened on those outside tables because I know when I'm sitting back home, I want to know what's happened. Do, do you think the, uh, the, the World Championship would be a more exciting event if it was a multi-table setup. No. I think snooker has got one problem actually. It hasn't got much tradition. Now it's been around since 1870s, you know, you know the story, the Indian, uh, me the officers mess in India, the British Army officers became bored with playing billiards, they needed a game where they could explore gambling and stuff, so snooker came, in uh, came into being. As a modern game, really, it started in the uh, the late 70s on TV, really, with extensive coverage. We've had Pod Black before that. So, we'll say 25 years, as we know it now. So it hasn't got much tradition. And one of the great traditions it's got is the Crucible. There's nothing wrong with the Crucible at all. The backstage facilities are inadequate. 890 seats, I think, there, so it is pretty uh, intimate. And you could sell more, 10 times more for the final. But all in all, I think it's a fantastic venue. It's got that that mystique. I mean, the press seats, you know, are so close to the table at the Crucible. There's a classic example. A guy from the Sunday Times, a feature writer came up called Rob Steen, who was a cricket writer, a nice guy, but he'd never covered snooker in his life. So he went into the arena. Now, we never do, because obviously I'm doing radio and stuff all the time, so I'm going to be called away. I'd, I'd be called away after every frame, so I watch it all on monitors in the, in the press room. But Rob Steen's gone in because he wants to sample the flavour of the, of the Crucible. So he's walked in backstage, and the guy said, yeah, the press seats are through there. So he's walked through, and he's realised, suddenly realised, he's walked through the curtain where all you guys walk through. And 890 heads look towards him because they think one of the players is coming out. So, of course, he's self-conscious now anyway. So he goes to sit down, and he's sitting in the press seats. And the press seats are so close to the black pockets, as you know, he was writing away, and he got a nylon nib on his pen. And Terry Griffiths, who was playing, actually asked him to stop writing because it was <laughs> taking him off. That's squeaking away. Yeah. So the Crucible, for me, is fantastic. And I, I think it would be a terrible day for the game if we did leave there, yeah. Well, I, I understand what you're saying. There is no, nowhere near as, uh, an intimate venue we're ever likely to play again in. But I think perhaps for the game to get bigger, personal feeling, I, I remember we, uh, that Sky's first ever introduction to snooker was a tournament that was actually uh, promoted by my manager, Barry Hearn, and it was called the Meter World Masters, and it was held at the NEC in Birmingham, and it was a multi-table setup. Not only did they have the, 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 the senior tournament, they had a junior, a women's uh, tournament, and a mixed doubles as well. There was a doubles event. There was everything going on. It was a, it was a, a celebration of snooker with a small trade fair on the side. And in a way, for me, if the game's going to get bigger, I know it may not be traditional, or any tradition we've got, but I think if the game's going to get bigger, I would love, love to see what that could end up being like. Yeah, the best two tournaments I've ever attended, undoubtedly, the 1996 World Cup in, uh, in Thailand. You know, all these exotic nations playing, none of them have got any chance really, apart from the established snooker nations. But that was, that was great to see, and there's some great moments there. The other tournament was that World Masters. 
there were a couple of things that needed tweaking around. You know, the women's doubles was played over a ridiculous amount of frames, and some matches finished at sort of 20 past four in the morning. I remember watching Martin Clark and Joe Johnson play a doubles match. And uh, it was myself and the cleaner who was waiting just to clean up around the table so that this match would actually finish. So there were a little things, a few things that needed tweaking, but generally speaking, what a tournament that was. So, what do you, uh, let's forget snooker just for the moment, just to finish off, what do you hope for yourself uh, for snooker for the future? I think for snooker, uh, the best thing that could happen is for international development. We've got it in certain outposts, Thailand. I remember once we. We were in Thailand and we went to the uh, floating market and I was sitting behind you on the boat. And we got off this boat and about 50 little urchins came running up and said, Steve Davis, Steve Davis. I mean, if Michael Jordan or Mohammed Ali had turned up, they could have been more excited. <laughs> so in these places, there, there is definite, definite potential for growth. Uh, and, and the biggest place is China. What we need is a bona fide uh, champion, either world champion, UK champion, a big tournament winner from overseas. That would be fantastic. It would be the best thing that could happen to snooker. Somebody said to me, wouldn't it be great if Jimmy White won the World Championship this year? And I have to agree, it would be fantastic for the game because it would generate enormous popularity. But I think in the long term, we really do need overseas players to come through. The problem, it isn't a problem we can say in any other sport, the problem, us Brits are too good. Well, you're a marvellous journalist, uh, great commentator, and, and as we said at the start, uh, you give Stato a, a good run for his money. Uh, thanks very much, Phil. It's been a pleasure. It's been an honour. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Cheers. you. <laughs>